Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first episode of the Empathy Conversations. I am uh, here with uh, my friend and colleague, Simon. Um, and um, I'm Haifa Stati. I'm the Executive Director of Empathy for Peace. Um, and I am also a uh, social work student and a technology consultant. Um, welcome, Simon. Thank you, Haifa. It's great to be having this conversation with you. Yeah, it's fantastic. I know we've been talking about this for a long time, so I'm glad that we're finally doing it. Um, Simon, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience and then we can get started. Sure, so I'm Simon Baron Cohen. I'm a psychologist at Cambridge University. Um, and uh, most of my day job uh, mm -hmm. is involved in, uh, in autism research, but I'm really proud to be part of a charity that we set up together. Uh, called Empathy for Peace, uh, which is really to explore the possible valuable contribution that empathy can make to conflict resolution. Maybe we'll talk a bit about that in this first episode. Uh, yeah. and I'm, I'm here in Cambridge. You're, you're there in Toronto. So this is, in very, Toronto. This, is, this is very global. It, it indeed is. And I think that's, you know, you and I set up this organization a few years ago now, and it is an international organization, even though um, I am here in Toronto, we have you in uh, Cambridge, and we have, you know, other members who are um, in Europe and the United States. Um, so it's been, it's been uh, a great group, and, and we've done a few fun things together, and this is the latest of them. So I know, Simon, when we first um, set out to create the organization, like one of the goals was bringing the science and especially the neuroscience that is happening um, around empathy and all the knowledge that's been created and bringing that um, into the practical world of peace building and conflict transformation, um, mm -hmm. truth and reconciliation and, and seeing how can we help people who are working on the ground to implement mm -hmm. those um, findings to make their work more effective. And, uh, yeah, yeah. No, if I think successful. back, if I think back, you know, we had the conference in 2016. We at did. The, the British Academy in London Yep. where we, we brought together about 20 Israelis and 20 Palestinians all around the topic of empathy neuroscience. Yep. You know, what, what do we understand about the psychology of empathy, how it's, how it's possible in the brain, um, how you can enhance your empathy, how you can lose your empathy, and its possible relevance, of course, to the Middle East conflict. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Yeah. So this is actually a good starting point uh, for us with um, explaining what empathy is, because it's something that we are talking a lot about lately. We hear a lot and it's defined differently in different areas. So I think it's always a good point, a starting point when you're talking about empathy mm. to be clear about how we're defining empathy yeah. in, in this case. So do you want to give us your classic definition? <laughs> I don't know about classic. It but is I'll, classic. I'll try, keep, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, so I wrote a book called Zero Degrees of Empathy. It was published um, by Penguin Random House in 2011, mm -hmm. also in the States. Um, so there I gave a definition of empathy as having two major components. So one is called cognitive empathy, which is the ability to put yourself into someone else's shoes and to imagine what they might be thinking or feeling. So it's the kind of recognition element, you know, I see your face or I see your situation and I try to imagine what, what must it be like to be Haifa, for example. Mm -hmm. And then the other component of empathy is what's called affective empathy, which is once I've tried to imagine your thoughts and feelings or another person, how does it make me feel? And do I have an appropriate emotion that's triggered by your thoughts and feelings, you know, or what I imagine them to be. So affect is, affective is just another word for emotional empathy. And it's more about, you know, does it really, does it bother you? Does it upset you? You know, are you happy for someone else's happiness? Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a whole range of emotions, but the key thing is it should be appropriate to the other person's state of mind. Mm -hmm. is it, and if you just had one part of empathy and not the other, if you could do the recognition part, but it didn't somehow move you, 
you know, that's not really empathy. You know, yeah. that's, you know, a psychopath can do that. Yeah. They, they can recognize that you're in pain, but it doesn't bother them, you know. Yeah. And that's or or they may even use that to manipulate you and, and gain, yeah. yeah. yeah and so this, that second part of empathy is probably just as important. Absolutely. Um, because it shows that you care about another person. That once you've recognized what, you, what they think or feel, you're kind of impelled, you're motivated to do something about it. You know, if they're, if they're suffering, you want to rush over and help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great definition. I really love it because I think it's, um, it's not, yeah, it's important to not just recognize the emotions. And I think people often kind of stop at that. But there is that second part of actually taking action. And, you yeah. know, it, for me, it's a very, it's about, from an activist perspective, it's a really important it's about, you know, what do you do with the information once you have yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. And we could talk about, you know, the potential application of empathy to activism, as you said, mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. But empathy happens in everyday life, in every situation. In fact, in every interaction. Absolutely. You could argue that if, you, if your empathy is not switched on, you know, then what are you doing? You're kind of treating a person as if they're not important, as if their subjectivity doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, you're, you know, you're at risk of treating the person as an object uh, where all kinds of levels of cruelty become possible. Yeah. But, if, but if your empathy is kind of switched on in, in every conversation, in every interaction, probably it pushes you more towards kindness than towards cruelty, that you're yeah. being sensitive to the other person, how they're feeling, what you might say that might upset them, mm -hmm. um, offend them, uh, or ignore, or kind of make them feel marginalised or, you know, as if they don't matter. There's, you know, so I think, I think empathy is kind of vital to even one-to-one -one interactions, not just at the more political level. Yeah, yeah. And that's why when I think about empathy for peace and, um, you know, peace building in general, I don't always, I don't think of it as just political conflict and political peace building. It's, it's really just the work we do in our everyday life to create more happy and safe and peaceful communities. Yeah. So whether that's with our neighbor or at school or at work or yeah, with people that look different from us and you can, you know, you can extra extrapolate that um, no, I totally broader and broader. I totally agree. So we could think of empathy as having an important role in your neighborhood, you know, you could get into conflict with your neighbor mm -hmm. or you could, you know, try to imagine what's it like to be my neighbor, you know. Yeah, um, I think it's got a big role in um, parenting, mm -hmm. you know, how we yes. bring up our children. You know, yeah. we, could, we, you know, if we're stressed, we could shout at our kids. We could even hit our kids as a form of like punishment or discipline. But that would be lacking empathy because what's it like to be that small child? on the receiving end of a big adult who's shouting or, or being violent. Yeah. You know, and we know from psychological research that if children experience abuse or neglect or you know, um, any kind of conflict at home, that has long-term consequences for their mental health, yeah. for their well-being, for their ability to form trusting relationships as adults. Yeah. So empathy is really important in so many areas of life. Yeah, absolutely. And so because empathy is so important, I am always thinking about how do we cultivate empathy? It's something I think about for myself. Of course, I'm a parent and, and a member of the community. And so how do I work on increasing my empathy? And also, is it that, you know, do, are people born with different levels of empathy? Are some people more gifted than others? And those who may be born with less empathy, is there things we can do to improve our empathy or are we doomed? It's either we just, we have it or we don't. Sure. Um, I think these are great questions, and um, I think maybe the scientific community who might be listening to our conversation. <laughs> so we better be careful. <laughs> well, I think I think they might be interested in you know both the biology, yes. but also the kind of social factors mm -hmm. that contribute to how much empathy you have, or anyone has. So kind of one of the big insights is that we all differ in how much empathy we have. Mm 
You know, most of us are average in empathy and there are ways of measuring it. Some people are above average, you know, that they're really tuned into other people, um, very quick to pick up on how other people are feeling, very good at reading faces or reading intonation, body language. And some people struggle with this, you know, that they're below average. And the, the big question is, you know, why are some people better than others, you know? And we've already touched on the fact that your early experience can either nurture your empathy or maybe blunt your empathy, you know, so that it doesn't develop, as, you know, to its full potential. That if you, if you are on the receiving end of neglect or abuse, we know from the, the longitudinal studies that those kids grow up much more likely to get into violence, um, to get into, um, you know, distrusting relationships, maybe to get into crime. There's all kinds of consequences, going back to the early work by John Bowlby, the paediatrician. Mm -hmm. um, so social factors are clearly important, you know, but what we've also started discovering is that biology plays, plays a role too. So for example, we were able to do a study with the company 23andMe. Mm -hmm. So that's, you've probably heard of it, but it's a genomics company. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, know, you pay your money and you can find out about your genome, your genetic yep. makeup. And we asked people to take a couple of different empathy tests um, and the company then had the DNA. Mm -hmm. and we, were, we were able to find statistical associations between how you score on the empathy test and particular quite common genetic variants that we all carry. Mm. So, you know, genetics also plays a role. Mm -hmm. And we've done studies also looking at uh, hormones, part of our biology. But it turns out that, you know, how much testosterone a baby is exposed to even during pregnancy is associated with how much empathy they show later in their childhood. So I don't want to minimize the importance of the social environment, but we also have to be kind of balanced and recognize we are ultimately animals. You know, we have a body, we have genes, we have hormones, we have neurotransmitters. Yeah. We, these things also play a part. And of course, you know, the end result is a mix of biology and culture or experience. Yeah, it's it's fascinating the, the science of it for sure, but it it sounds like, I mean, biology is important, and so some of us are going to have different degrees of empathy just by virtue of our biology, but yeah. also we can take what we have and work with it, yeah. um, and and do things to build on it and improve it and practice the empathy that we have. In, Absolutely. In so we, I mean, you know, we wouldn't have set up this charity. If, right. we did, if we didn't believe that people can grow their empathy. Yeah. You know, and we, would, we wouldn't bother try putting so much time into raising our kids in the best possible way. If yeah. we didn't believe that we could cultivate more empathy in children. The same is true for social workers who are working with victims of, you know, quite difficult environmental conditions. Same is true of teachers who put a lot of energy into, you know, trying to improve, uh, I suppose, the social skills and the emotional intelligence of, of mm -hmm. children. It's not just about learning facts. It's also about creating good citizens. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in future conversations, we'll, we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about some of the concrete things that have been shown to improve our empathy and, and you know, give peop keep people an idea of what some of these things they can work do to improve and um, practice I think their I think empathy. That'd be great. You know, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think one of the things that the charity wants to do is figure out how can we take the basic science of empathy and turn it into practical tools mm -hmm. you know, so that empathy can be cultivated, can be um, you know, can be expanded in yeah. all walks of life. You know, when we think about life under COVID, how can we become more empathic citizens, you know, to help each other. Yeah. If, we, if we think about the US election that's coming up, you know, yeah. um, what do voters need to think about when they're looking at the potential leaders? You know, there's so yeah. many different applications. To there, 
There are. And, and for our audience listening, I'll just let you know, we are going to be covering all of these topics in future conversations. So make yeah. sure yeah. Um, to stay tuned. Now, I think one, one thing we wanted to touch on uh, briefly in today's conversation is the relevance of empathy to political conflict and conflict yeah. transformation. Yeah. And you and I have participated in a few of these conversations. Um, yeah that are specifically um, about the conflict in Israel and Palestine. Mm -hmm. You know, for both of us, this is a, a topic that's dear to our hearts with me being a Palestinian and having been born and, and grown up in, in Palestine. Um, and uh, uh, with you, Simon, uh, a Jewish uh, individual who's also really interested in that conflict. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I remember that you and I were both invited to talk at the United Nations seminar on Palestine mm -hmm. because we wanted to explore, you know, there's been this 70 years of conflict between Israel and Palestine since Israel was created. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's in that 70 years, there's been, I think, over 12 wars, mm -hmm. you know, with a lot of damage to both communities. Mm -hmm. There's been... Um, you know, a lot of a lot of loss of life, a lot of injury. You know, uh, but in particular, also, um, the Palestinian community has, if we look at it today, is 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 living almost under siege. Mm -hmm. You know, um, particularly in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. You know. It's, it's a, a conflict that has not yet been resolved, and yet different strategies have been tried, military, you know, economic, legal, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And you and I kind of talked at the UN, but also in our own conversations about whether there's maybe space for a new approach, mm -hmm. which yeah. is how to, how to cultivate empathy within individuals in each of these two communities so that they start to recognize more about what they share than about how they differ, you know. Yeah, yeah, we, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's an interesting um, display of empathy between two individuals when you and I have those conversations because we don't always agree, right? And, no. and, and even when we went and spoke um, in, uh, at the UN in front of a largely Palestinian and Arab audience, you know, there was some reactions um, oh. to us because of course, um, I think when you bring up the topic of empathy with Palestinian people, there is a little bit of a reaction because, um, you know, we have to keep in mind the power dynamics in the conflict and the differential in power. Mm -hmm. And when you have, you know, a population that's largely under occupation and under siege, um, so, and, 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 again, and because of the lack of understanding and knowledge of what empathy is, we sometimes hear sympathy instead of empathy, or even if we do un hear empathy, the question is, you mm. know, how am I able to empathize with um, an oppressive power, and mm. how is that even helpful? Um, yeah. And we talked about how... We did. We, we did, because sometimes the assumption is that empathy should be between two equals. And uh, both parties should be displaying an equal amount of empathy for the other. But I think if, you're, if your starting point is a conflict where there's been a kind of military power, you know, let's say a first world military power, which is Israel, um, showing oppression towards an occupied population, then the starting point is very unequal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even if Israelis might say, and I'm sure many will be listening to us, but what about us? We've been victims too. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course, people in both communities have been victims of violence. That's what happens in wars. But there is an unequal power balance. And I remember when we were in the UN meeting, you know, some Palestinians said, how can we show, how can we show empathy for an Israeli whilst we're looking up the barrel of his gun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and it made me stop and think, right? And, and part of, I think part of what, what happened at that UN meeting was, was also about listening and learning. Mm 
Uh, and that's kind of what we're still trying to do in our charity. We're trying to, trying to listen, trying to learn. Yeah. Um, and I would, you know, my, the, what, I, what I took home from that, that seminar was that perhaps if empathy has a role in the Middle East and in, particularly in Israel, Palestine, it's the Israelis who might be in a more comfortable position economically and militarily who might have to take the first step of showing empathy for what is it like for the millions of people living in Gaza, many of whom are unemployed, um, overcrowding, high levels of poor mental health because of lack of resources and lack of freedom. And maybe you can tell me a little bit about what you know about what life is like. Mm -hmm. You know, for an Israeli to take that perspective, that might already start humanizing you know, the Israelis to start thinking about Palestinians as people, not as politically inconvenient or as the enemy or uh, as a potential threat. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is something that we're trying to cultivate, trying to explore, yeah. For sure. And I think if I think about it for me personally, I feel like I've come through a journey when it comes to empathy, because as you've mentioned, I did, I grew up, you know, I was born in the West Bank in Palestine and I grew up there um, to a father who was a refugee. Um, so my father and his family were forced to flee their village um, just outside Haifa and he became a refugee. He lost his dad in 48, you know, in, in, in the, the events of, of the creation of the state of Israel. And so he grew up, uh, my father grew up as an orphan. He became a politically active person, which meant um, he was in jail most of my um, childhood and upbringing. So in turn, I grew up without my father. So was in my, when I think about my family and my childhood and, and yeah. my life, there was a lot of suffering that mm. as a, at least as a child, always felt like it was, you know, all of my suffering in my life was because of this one force. Um, yeah. And when, uh, uh, entity that was inflicting all the suffering and 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 it, it's hard to then start thinking about empathy but where I've come in my journey is really actually going back to your definition of empathy which is at the very beginning it's a cognitive process so it's not necessarily about agreeing or yeah. sympathizing or liking the other yeah. uh, person it's about understanding yeah. their circumstances and where they're coming from and the forces that have yeah. led them to take a certain action. You know, part of what you've been saying, it raises so many different issues. You know, sure. so, so, what, so one thing is, you know, that it's amazing that you and I can be having this conversation. Because mm -hmm. I was raised in a Jewish family, um, quite a Zionistic family. Um, and many Israelis, Israeli Jews, uh, don't get to meet Palestinians, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's a physical war, but, you know, they don't feel it's, you know, uh, their, their government doesn't advise them to have contact yep. with, with Palestinians either in the West Bank or, or Gaza. So that kind of separation can already become a kind of breeding ground for in-group, out-group mm -hmm. attitudes, you know, um, you know, judgment about the other community. But the other thing, just kind of listening to you is, you know, you're talking about your grandfather having to leave Palestine, Palestine just on the brink of when Israel was created. Uh, what happened to him? Uh, my grandfather was killed by um, uh, the armed militias that was going around. Um, and that's as much of the story as I know. Right. Yeah, but I mean, you know, that is, you know, a huge personal loss to, to your family. It's a trauma that has shaped the, the next, you know, two, three yeah. generations of my family, yeah. for sure. Well, you know, if I think about my grandfather and how I would feel if my grandfather was, was shot by a militia or whatever, you know, it makes me cry just thinking about it. Yes. So trying to imagine what that must have felt like for you. Yes. It's huge. And for you, and this was your father's father? My father's father, yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking, yeah. you know. And yet, I imagine that many Israelis don't kind of give enough mental space to imagining what's it like for that young Palestinian girl to lose her grandfather. 
Yeah. Yeah. And maybe they're preoccupied by their own losses because, of course, there have been losses the other way. And, yeah. you know, part of what we have to constantly try to remind ourselves is even that young Israeli soldier who's like 19 years old pointing a gun when, when he's on patrol in, in the West Bank. You know, he's come from a family where maybe they've been running to bomb shelters whilst there were rockets firing into his country, you know. What was it like for that kid growing up? You know, and I've met these Israeli kids. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, the question is, how do we cultivate that kind of mutual recognition of suffering, of shared su suffering, and who should take the first step? And I think, I think what I, I think my, where, the point I've got to in thinking about this is that maybe the Israelis should take the first step. Because if you look at the levels of economic affluence, and, and today, a sense of security it wasn't always like that within Israel. They're, they're, they're in a far more secure position, I think, than the Palestinians. And they, they, could, they could afford to reach out and start to kind of have these conversations, yeah. you know. Uh, I would have to agree with you. I think, again, because empathy is such a, it's not an easy process. It's hard work. You actually have to work at it. Um, and you need that mental space and safety, I think it's hard to do that when you're occupied by, you know, concerns about your actual physical safety in your day-to-day -day yeah. life or, yeah. or, you know, so much of just surviving. Um, I, think, I think the other thing is that um, when you've felt under threat, Israel, Israelis have felt under threat from Palestinians and vice versa, you know, the experience of threat puts you into a state of anxiety and a state of fight or flight. And that can block your empathy. That's one way that you can lose your empathy, where all you want to do is, is fight, or if you've lost a relative, you want to get revenge. You know, mm -hmm. it's very hard to be empathic whilst you're feeling these emotions of hate or revenge or anger or injustice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So cultivating empathy is gonna, it's gonna need the right kind of setting and maybe starting to kind of see individuals as as individuals you know not just as an israeli representing this kind of abstract military regime but as a person maybe whose grandparent came from the holocaust mm -hmm. you know or a, a person who's also lost their grandparent yeah um you know i think um yeah. i'm a big uh my hope is that we can connect around the traumas we both experience as nations yeah. and, and peoples and, and find um, empathy in, in those events and moments. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, as we come to the near the end of our conversation, is it's it just um, incredible to think about just how complex and complicated uh, and multifaceted, uh, you know, this particular conflict is and um, you know, I, I am a believer in that it's not going to take one strategy or one approach. It's going to take a whole bunch of them. Uh -huh. um, but I think uh, empathy is a great lens uh, to put in uh, that can actually make, you know, any and all of the other nonviolent approaches um, hopefully more effective and, and more productive because, again, yeah. uh, we can you know, in any conflict, really, we can get so much faster to a solution if we start, you know, practicing those skills of understanding where the person across from us is coming from, and then having a more appropriate reaction or, or feeling towards yeah, that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I think it's maybe appropriate that we're having this conversation just the day after the Jewish festival of um, the Day of Atonement, right? because that's meant to be a sort of collective festival where, where the community thinks, who, who, have I, who have I caused harm to? Who might I have hurt? And you spend the day kind of thinking, have I offended somebody? Have I hurt somebody? And can I apologize to them? You know, because sometimes just that recognition that you may have harmed somebody. Yeah. Unintentionally, intentionally, you know, but it's creating the opportunity.
yeah. for the kind of other positive emotion, which is forgiveness. But that kind of, it's not, it's not going to happen overnight when you've had like a 70 year conflict, the one we're talking about. It, but you know, that, that's where we're trying to head towards, you know, it's like, you know, just like in South Africa, where it started with truth and, recon and then reconciliation. Yeah. You know, but you have to start with the truth of have I hurt another person? Yeah. And, and can, I, can I kind of uh, make some, um, I don't know, apology or mm -hmm. make some steps towards that person to just acknowledge how they feel? Yeah. What a beautiful meditation on empathy that is. Um, that's great to hear. Well, Simon, thank you so much for uh, joining me on this conversation today. Um, I think we will stop here. We, we, I know you and I can go on for hours and hours, but we will stop here. And uh, I just want to thank uh, whoever tuned in to listen to us for doing that and looking forward to chatting with you again soon. Um, and yeah, see everyone next time. Okay, lovely to see you, Haifa. Good to see you, Simon. Bye. Okay. Bye.